please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Kevin Walsh. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. This is an incredible lecture series, and I'm honored to be a part of it. So today, uh, I'm tasked with the really fun topic of talking about asteroid impacts. This is a really fun topic. Uh, it really is. And, it, and we could take it any number of places. So let me explain where I come from and what I do and how that's going to bias what I talk about. So I work at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, and I work with a couple of different groups. Uh, one is a uh, NASA Lunar Science Institute, where we try to understand the origin and evolution of the moon. And to do so, we need to think about the entire history of the moon and everything that's impacted it over its entire lifetime. So we're really interested in the population of bodies they come near Earth and come near the terrestrial planets and hit things. So that's one aspect. But I also work with NASA's uh, space mission called OSIRIS-REx, which is tasked with the important job of going to a near-Earth asteroid, picking up a sample, and bringing it back to Earth. So for this, we're interested in getting as much context as possible about our asteroid that we're visiting so that when we study the sample, we know what the heck we're looking at. So I'm interested in the history and the evolution of the solar system is told by the asteroids that we see and that we can visit and that sometimes visit us. And so that's my context. We may remember this from the news from February. In Chelyabinsk, Russia, a very large meteor entered the atmosphere, I think closer to 17 kilometers per second. And as it heated up due to the interaction with the atmosphere, it exploded in a couple of different air bursts, making these huge flashes, which were brighter than the sun, very briefly. And then pieces of it eventually made it to ground. Now, when it exploded, it created a shock wave that went towards the ground and shattered windows in this town in northern Russia, knocked people over, broke the roof of a factory, and so on. So it had a very, very dramatic effect, even though it was only about 10 or 20 meters across, so the size of a school bus. Now, this was an exciting event, uh, not because it was dramatic and captured with so much footage and, and YouTube videos that were really exciting and, and really dramatic, but we were able to go and pick up pieces and advance scientific studies to understand more about this object and more about this process. And so this event, which was all over the news and really exciting, poses a lot of questions that we really want to try to answer. First, what was this? How big was this? Why did it do what it did? These are big questions. Where did it come from? Which part of space did this thing come from? And how often does this happen? <laughs> we could say, will this happen in my town? That's a fair question. So if we want to answer these questions and we want to understand this event and other events like this, let's step back and get context for the solar system. So let's start with the source for these guys, asteroids. These near-Earth asteroids and these meteors that impact the Earth come from asteroids that live in the main asteroid belt. So let's get the geography of the solar system down before we get to where the asteroids actually live. So first of all, we have the Earth on an orbit around the Sun. The near-end planet Mercury, then Venus, and finally Mars and Jupiter. So this is our geography. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, a very big gap and then Jupiter. Now in 1801, an Italian astronomer discovered an object between Mars and Jupiter. So the planets at the time followed a pretty well-ordered spacing, and people thought they understood the, the architecture of the solar system. So the discovery of Ceres, orbiting right in the middle of this gap, turned everything over. And it was called a planet for the next 50 years until people started discovering a large number of its cohorts in the asteroid belt. Now, Ceres is a very interesting object. It's the largest asteroid by far. It contains over half the mass of the entire asteroid belt, just in this object. And we are going to visit this object next year. NASA's Dawn space mission will be going into orbit around Ceres sometime next summer. On the way to Ceres, the Dawn spacecraft stopped and orbited the asteroid Vesta, which is the second most massive asteroid in the asteroid belt. It orbited for around a year and took spectacular photography like this. Now, 
we've been lucky that we've seen a handful of other asteroids uh, during our various exploration of the solar system. The, the European spacecraft Rosetta flew by the asteroid Lutetia, which is about 100 miles across, uh, a rare physical characterization. We thought it was made mostly of metal, and we found that on its surface it's scattered with all sorts of different pieces of other asteroids. The asteroid Matilda, this was taken by the NASA spacecraft NEAR. This is about 50 miles across, and we were shocked when we saw this object because we didn't expect that a body 50 miles across could have a crater around 30 miles across, a crater almost the size of the asteroid. We also discovered flying by it that it has a very low density, whereas the asteroid Lutetia that we just saw has a density around three or four times the density of water, Matilda is around or possibly even below the density of water, suggesting that it's a lot of empty space, a lot of porosity, something we didn't understand and is probably correlated to these really large, really, really large craters that we see on its surface. When Galileo was on the way to Jupiter, it flew by asteroid 243 Ida. It's about 15 kilometers across and isn't particularly spectacular, except for this really fascinating discovery by Galileo that found that Ida has a small satellite that was eventually named Dactyl. It had been hypothesized that asteroids themselves could have satellites, but this was the first detection. And later on in the talk, we'll get to some evidence that it had always hinted at this, but we had never able to, uh, to actually prove it. So these are the asteroids that we can study the best. These are the ones we've flown by with spacecraft, we've taken up close photos, and we've actually seen their surfaces. The rest of our knowledge from asteroids comes from either imaging from telescopes on Earth or the collection of meteorites, which we've always inferred are pieces of these asteroids. But what we really want to study are the asteroids that come closest to the Earth. These are the ones that will eventually impact our surface uh, and create the events like Chelyabinsk or the, the very dramatic event 65 million years ago. So near-Earth asteroids, as you can expect, are the ones that orbit nearest the Earth. Their orbits have left the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and they've come into orbits where they, they pass very close to the Earth, very close to Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Now, we've been lucky enough to visit two of these guys. And so like we have for that main asteroid belt, we have a few interesting images. First, the second largest asteroid is er Eros. We visited this with the NEAR mission that actually landed on its surface in February of 2001. And at the opposite end of the size spectrum, the Japanese mission Hayabusa visited Itakawa, which is only about 300 meters across. It also touched its surface. It orbited for about a year, went down to the surface, attempting to collect a, a large sample, and then ended up bringing back a few grains of dust which, even though they were extremely small, has helped to confirm a lot of what we had thought we knew about this asteroid from observing it on the ground. So two missions to two near-Earth asteroids, and we've made contact with both of them. Now, when we look at the whole population of near-Earth asteroids, we can do a simple experiment. This is something we did a while ago, where we can take all of the orbits of our near-Earth asteroids, and we can model them going forward. We can build a computer simulation, and we model their orbits as they evolve around the sun, interacting with our terrestrial planets. So if we're going to model an asteroid orbiting the sun, we need to consider that the Earth and Venus and Mars are nearby, and it won't be a very long time before it interacts closely with one of them, and its orbit will change. Their orbits are very chaotic, and they evolve very rapidly when we consider the timescales of the solar system. So what we find are that most of these asteroids will impact the sun or impact one of the planets. Some of them, their orbits will get scattered around enough where they'll visit Jupiter, and Jupiter will send them out of the solar system. And so we can do these models very carefully, and we find out that on average, our near-Earth asteroids only survive for around 10 million years. Now, only, I can use only because we're thinking about the whole history of the solar system, which is over 4 billion years. So if they only survive for 10 million years, then why are any of them left? The cratering record on the moon shows us very clearly 
that the population of things hitting the moon has been relatively steady for most of this four billion years. So the population that we see today is essentially a steady state. It's constantly being refilled from somewhere. So where do our near-Earth asteroids come from? And so for this, I'll show you the, the first formula that we'll see tonight. Essentially, it's gravity and sunlight. These are the two pieces of physics that we need to constantly refill our population of near-Earth asteroids. So gravity. As I mentioned, this is their orbits, once they reach the near-Earth population, are very chaotic. They're getting bounced around by the terrestrial planets because they're having very close encounters with them. And it makes it very easy for those planets to change their orbits and to move them around, scatter them about. But in the main asteroid belt, there's no big planets around. So how is gravity going to, to change their orbits and, and move them around so, so drastically? And so we can, we can look for a sign of what's happening in the asteroid belt by taking the population that lives between Mars and Jupiter and just simply plotting up the number of asteroids at a given distance. So this is just the population as we move outwards, how many asteroids there are at a given distance. And something jumps out, as it did to an astronomer named Kirkwood in the 19th century. They get these big gaps where asteroids just don't like to live. Just really severely depleted regions of the asteroid belt. And what Kirkwood discovered is that these correlate to orbital periods around the sun that are integer ratios of Jupiter's period. So three to one means that every three orbits of the asteroid is exactly one orbit of Jupiter. So our asteroid goes around the sun three times and it sees Jupiter over there. It goes around three more times, sees Jupiter in the same place. And it keeps seeing Jupiter at the same time in its orbit. So Jupiter, this huge mass, very far away, perturbs the orbit dramatically. For most asteroids, this gets averaged out around its orbit. But for these asteroids, the perturbation from Jupiter is always at the same spot. And it can really push and pull on their orbits and change them really dramatically. So I built a model of this to show the effect, to show how interactions with Jupiter in a resonance like this, we call this a, a mean motion resonance, when you have an integer period ratio with Jupiter, to see how they evolve and how they end up being near-Earth asteroids. So our model here is showing the orbit of Jupiter, our big circle, where I took the orbit of Jupiter and just plotted it as an ellipse or a circle, instead of showing Jupiter running around the sun because we're going to follow this for a few million years. And if we watched Jupiter go around, we'd be here for all night. All year, really. So we have the orbit of Jupiter, the orbit of Earth, Venus, or sorry, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. And then our orange orbit is our asteroid in the asteroid belt. Now what's really interesting, one aspect of this, is since we're plotting their ellipses, we'll see that there, a lot of the planet's orbits aren't perfectly circular. And so they're actually ellipses. And these ellipses move around over time. So we'll see these things bouncing around a little bit, the planets themselves. But the dramatic change is we'll see our asteroid, our orange circle, is going to change very dramatically. Because what I'm doing is I'm pushing it into one of these resonances with Jupiter. And so what we'll see is that Jupiter will, will bounce its orbit around, pull it and push it, and eventually it will get so elongated that its orbit will start crossing the planets, the terrestrial planets, Mars and Earth. It'll encounter one of them, and its orbit will change dramatically, becoming a near-Earth asteroid. Well, <laughs> you may have to take my word on that. All right. I'm very sorry. You will have to take my word on that. I will try to load it up at the end of the talk during the question session, because it's on here somewhere. The effect, as I described, is as I push this asteroid slowly into this mean motion resonance, the asteroid's orbit becomes very elongated, so that the part closest to the sun begins to cross Mars and eventually crosses the orbit of Earth, whereby an encounter with Earth changes the entire shape of its orbit, shrinks it, while it's still crossing the Earth and Mars, 
but is nowhere near Jupiter. And again, I'm sorry, you have to take my word for this because it's not coming up. So I will try to load it up during the question session. But a fair question to ask about this is, why did I push it into a resonance? Why did I move the asteroid around? This interaction with Jupiter can change its orbit such that I can make it cross the terrestrial planets, which will make it become a near-Earth asteroid. But why in the main asteroid belt is it moving back and forth, moving into a resonance with Jupiter? And so that's the second part of the equation, sunlight. So this will provide us the force that we need to push our asteroid. So let's zoom in on one of our asteroids there between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. It's on its orbit around the sun. It's nice and circular. It's not interacting with Jupiter. Everything is safe, fine, and fun. Now, if we look at what the solar radiation is doing to this asteroid, it's pretty intuitive that over time, or actually very rapidly, solar radiation will heat up its surface. The surfaces of our asteroids, as we saw from these pictures, is made up with rocky, stony material. Uh, some of us, maybe we've held meteorites before. Uh, you can pick them up, and they're frequently mistaken for normal terrestrial rocks. Some are a little bit heavier in pieces of iron, but others feel like normal rock. And we know that if normal rock heats up or is in the sun, it'll heat up. So that's what's going to happen. This rocky material will slowly heat up due to solar radiation, but then like a normal rock here on Earth, it will re-emit some of that heat later on. So we heat our rocks up, we heat up the surface of the asteroid, and eventually it will re-emit that radiation. Now, if this geometry stayed the same, the re-emission would cancel out the absorbed solar radiation. But our asteroid in space isn't staying the same. Our asteroids are rotating. They're moving. They're bouncing around. So here, we've heated up part of our asteroid, and we've shifted our asteroid due to its rotation. Now, the thermal inertia, the ability of this rock to hold the absorbed radiation, is significant. There will be a time lag between when it absorbs the radiation and heats up to its highest temperature, and when it later re-emits that is thermal radiation. So this time lag is something like hours. This is something that we experience here on Earth, where the hottest part of the day is 2 or 3 p.m. It's not noon when the, when the sun is directly overhead. It takes a while to heat everything up, and we get to our highest temperature, and then we start to emit that, that heat away. The same thing is happening on the, the surfaces of our asteroid. We're heating it up all day, all throughout the day as it sees the sun, and in the afternoon, it re-emits that radiation, this thermal, thermal radiation. Now, our arrows are no longer around, aligned. The, radi the radiation from the sun is being absorbed in one direction and re-emitted in a different direction. So even though we're only dealing with the momentum from light, which is very, very, very small, we have four billion years to play with. And that adds up. And so this, these little arrows here, lead to a little thrust in this direction. And this can really add up. So that our asteroid here, rotating in this direction, what I would call the prograde direction, the same direction as it orbits the sun, it's getting a little kick, very little kick, but it's a little kick. And over time, this adds up and expands its orbit. So let's take a different example. Our asteroid's rotating the other direction. All things being equal, these rotation directions are essentially random. So our little kicks are going the other direction, kind of working against its orbit, and its orbit shrinks. So the answer is, asteroids are mobile. They can move around simply due to the fact that they're heating up and later re-emitting this radiation. Now, as we might guess, this is very size dependent. The smaller you are, you have more surface area compared to your mass, and you can move faster. That asteroid Ceres, or Vesta, or Lutetia, they will not move over their lifetime due to this effect. But something that's one kilometer, or even 10 kilometers, can move very, very far distances across the asteroid belt. Something 10 meters 
can move across the entire asteroid belt in under a billion years. So we have plenty of time to move these guys into these resonances and to create our near-Earth asteroids. We can look at it this way. In the plot that we saw before of our entire asteroid belt, they're going to move one direction or the other. They're rotating one way or the other. Very few asteroids can survive in a very long time in a non-rotating state because they'll bump into someone else or someone will hit them and they'll start spinning one direction and they'll start migrating. So, given that we're moving our asteroids around and they're entering into these resonances with Jupiter, they're becoming near-Earth asteroids, we know what's going to happen next. Eventually, we're going to get impacts. We know that our near-Earth asteroids only live for 10 million years, and most of them end up hitting a planet. So, this is where they're going. We're emptying out our asteroid belt, we're sending them onto near-Earth orbits, and once they're there, it's inevitable. We're going to get impacts. So let's start in recent time and work our way backwards a little bit. One of the very famous ones in 1908 in Siberia was the Tunguska impact. Uh, this was very interesting because there was no one around to see this. No one at all in this region of Siberia. And it took about 20 years before a team worked their way up there to pick up samples and to look at the, the damage that it was done. So it was thought that this was only something, somewhere between about 50 meters and one kilometers across, and it had an evolution similar to that to what we saw in Chelyabinsk. This meteor never hit the ground. It was heated up due to its entry in the atmosphere, and it exploded over the ground and created destruction such as this, trees being knocked over, on about a 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer area. The total power of this impact was a thousand times greater than the atomic bomb dropped in World War II. From something between 50 and 1,000 meters across. For scale, I've roughly outlined what this would look like on one of our favorite metropolitan areas. We're, from what I understand, we are, we're totally fine down here, so <laughs> don't worry about it. So this is another famous impact crater. This is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. This happened about 50,000 years ago, and it was actually a, a similar size object as the one in Tunguska. Now, this is different than Tunguska. Tunguska, we saw this huge area where a shockwave flattened trees and did all sorts of damage, whereas here we have this really deep and well-shaped impact crater in the desert. So the difference for this evolution is that this meteorite was a nickel, iron, heavy, heavy, dense meteorite. That the interaction with the atmosphere, even though it was being heated, didn't make it explode. It was a very strong body, it was very dense, and it could easily crash its way through the atmosphere to hit the surface of the Earth and create this deep impact crater. Pieces of that meteorite were pulled out of the center of this eventually and studied, which helped us understand that this was, in fact, an asteroid impact crater. Again, like the impacts before, the velocity at the surface when it hit was around 13 kilometers per second. This impact crater is a little bit harder to see. So let me describe what we're looking at here. This line right here between the, the shaded area below and the lighter area up top is the current location of the northern part of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So all of this is underwater and all of this below is land. What we're looking at is a gravity anomaly. So we measure the change in the force of gravity due to some higher density material under the surface. And what we can see so we kind of have a ring shape here and a bit of a ring shape here. This is almost 200 miles across, this big one. So this hinted that this was an impact crater. 
But in the 80s, people actually drilled a core into these regions and pulled out the sediment below there, and they found this layer which contained high amounts of iridium, which is very rare on Earth, but is very common on asteroids, as we determined from meteorites. When we look at this layer in the sediment all around the globe, in Colorado and in Europe, we can see that this layer, this boundary layer in the sediment, dated back to 65 million years ago, you can see about a one centimeter thick layer of dust from 65 million years ago that has a similar level of iridium and similar properties to what was found here in the presumed impact crater. So not only did it create, create this structure that, that we've then been able to study, but we can look at different parts of the globe because the impact crater created so much dust and debris that it circled the Earth, created a layer all around the, the globe. This is known as the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan. And it is presumed, at least in my field, that this was the event uh, that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. There are competing theories, and there are other ways that such huge global climatic changes could happen. But the dates for this crater are pretty sound at 65 million years. The evidence for it around the globe is pretty sound. Uh, and that, I would say, is, is one of the leading theories right now on the extinction of the dinosaurs. So going further back in time to a slightly bigger impact, this is Manic oh, Manicouagan in Canada, about 215 million years ago. And what we're looking at is the inner ring of that same impact structure that we just saw in Chicxulub. This is the inner ring here that's been filled in by flowing rivers to create this really interesting structure. You can kind of make out the outer structure, but it's a little bit harder to see. 215 million years is a long time and a lot of erosion. So this was estimated to be about the same size impactor as the one in Chicxulub, and it's associated or thought to be associated with the, Car the end Carnian extinction event. So this as well is thought to have been related to a massive extinction event on Earth. East and West Clearwater Lakes, also in northern Canada. Northern Canada is a good place to store our impact craters. What we're looking at here is what's called a digital elevation map, where we've gone over the surface and we've mapped the elevation, and that's what we're plotting with the heat map, is that these are at lower elevation, our two lakes, they're actually filled in, they're lakes, and we can see underneath, we're seeing that inner ring structure, and then our outer, larger, outer crater. So this was the evidence before the discovery of Dactyl around Ida that asteroids might have satellites. Because these two impact craters have the similar age. They're both very close to 290 million years old, within the errors of our techniques. And the statistical probability of two big impactors hitting the Earth within a few hundred thousand years of each other and landing right next to each other is very, 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 very low. The time scale for impacts like this are very long. So two at the same time in the same neighborhood is probably not going to happen. So this always made us suspect that asteroids might have satellites. And that image of Ida and Dactyl was the first time that we actually saw one. Now we know of hundreds. So uh, we've come a long way. These two, though, are a bit spectacular because these are big craters dealing with 15 miles and about 10 miles across. So the impactors were about one and a half to two miles and around one mile across. And they were far enough apart when they impacted to create two distinct impact structures. And even though we know of lots of satellites around asteroids, we don't know of very many with these sorts of properties. So it's still telling us that we might be missing something in the asteroid population, which is exciting. And finally, Vraidfort. This is in South Africa. It's the oldest really confirmed impact structure on Earth, about two billion years old. This one was a little bit bigger probably than the Chicxulub, uh, somewhere between five and 10 kilometers across. There may have been one or two that we think were bigger, but our oldest one here is probably the biggest one that hit the Earth. It's very hard to see the remaining structure which is why this is our oldest known impact crater on Earth, 
is because the erosional forces of the Earth's atmosphere slowly erode these away and make it very, very, very hard to find these. A recent discovery in the last few years is that impacts can create a, sh a cloud of debris and molten droplets that enter the atmosphere and eventually rain down on Earth. And these molten droplets end up being a characteristic size and end up getting trapped in the sediment around the Earth. And some of the sediment on Earth can be dated back to very, very late times, up to even four billion years. And so by searching for these little droplets from our impacts, we can get signs of bigger impacts that happened earlier in the history of the Earth. So this is our limit for looking in the surface for the shape and structure of a crater. Even looking at gravity anomalies and interesting structures in our lakes and so on. But we can still go a little bit further by looking through the sediment and finding these little spirals that get emplaced in the sediment during the, the, the rain down of debris after a large impact. So we do have hints going back to around even four billion years of impacts such as this happening throughout our history. Though this is the oldest one that we have a good picture of. So we've marched back in time, and as we've gone back in time, up to two billion years, our impacts have gotten larger and larger and larger. And so this is telling us something, that these really, really big impacts are very infrequent. And that's a good thing, quite frankly, for for a lot of reasons. But we can chart this out. We can draw a map, roughly, of how often we expect these impacts to be happening. And we can compare it with reality, with what we're actually measuring. So what I'm plotting here is the size of the impactor on the x-axis, going from small to very large, going from 10 meters up to 10 kilometers. But what I'm plotting on the y-axis is the time between expected impacts for a body this big. So we take our population of asteroids and we run the numbers through what we think their evolution from the main belt into a resonance in a near-Earth orbit and the probability then of striking the Earth. And we can make this estimate of how frequently an object of a given size should impact the Earth. So if we start at the big end, we think that the KT impactor, the Chicxulub impactor, the one that hit the Yucatan, we think that it was somewhere between about 5 and 10 kilometers in size. So we're down here somewhere. Maybe we can use that point as a guide. When we draw it across, even though I don't have very good resolution over here, we're somewhere around 100 million years. That's about how frequently the KT impactor should happen. Now the last one we know of is Chicxulub, which was 65 million years ago. So that fits in. If we had one, say, 100,000 years ago, we'd be worried about our statistics. Because that's a really recent impact for something that only happens 10 million, or 100 million years. So this works out so far. Tunguska, Tunguska's a little tough because we don't know precisely how large it was. So I went with around 100 meters, 200 meters, we're seeing that those should happen every few hundred years or maybe a thousand years. Well, that's not quite right, because one happened in 1908, a hundred years ago. We'd be more comfortable in the few hundred year range than in the thousand year range, but we're in the ballpark. And finally, Chelyablinsk. This was about 20 meters across, and we're getting off the scale. We're right around here. Those should be happening every hundred years or so. But Chile blends happened in February, and our infrasonic detectors placed around the Earth during the Cold War, which can detect very, very large explosions in the atmosphere, picked up two or three in the last 40 years. So we're coming in a little high. We're getting more of these smaller guys like the Chilyabinsk than what we really thought. Now, we have a reason for that is these guys are very small. They're 20 meters across. So when we take all of the asteroids that we know of and we build our models for things coming from the main belt into near-Earth space, we're doing that for, for asteroids that we can see clearly, whose orbits we can model and understand. And those are kilometers or tens of kilometers across. But at these small sizes, we don't really see them until they're here. 
So we have to take these lines that we're drawing, extend them into space where we don't have much data. And so it's not a big shock that we've been a little surprised at how many of these are coming. But it means that there's a little bit more physics about their evolution that we need to know, which is pretty exciting and pretty fun. So what are we doing to better understand this population? What's going on today to discover NEOs? Well, here is a plot showing the number of NEOs discovered per year uh, for each of the different surveys that are, have been looking for them. We've got five or six listed there. They're typically in Arizona or Hawaii or in Chile, places with very, very good skies. And these, uh, these surveys image the entire sky per night, sometimes multiple times, and they track the different stars, they remove the stars, and they look for asteroids moving across the sky. And we can see a pretty clear trend that over time we're discovering more near-Earth asteroids every year. This is owing to the fact that we have more and better surveys online. This makes sense. We're looking harder, we're finding more stuff. So let's look only at large near-Earth asteroids, things one kilometer and larger. Well, it's pretty clear that our surveys are finding less and less. We peaked back in the late 90s, and now we're not finding nearly as many. So what's happening here? Are we getting worse at finding asteroids? Well, <laughs> that would be one explanation. But that's not it. It's actually, this is actually a good sign. Because when we take our models for the population of the near-Earth population and the near-Earth asteroids, from what we think we know about how they become near-Earth asteroids from the main belt, and we look at what we've discovered versus what we expect, this is actually a sign that we're doing well. It's estimated there's around 1,000, I think 980, near-Earth asteroids larger than one kilometer across. And so the reason we've been slowing down our detection rate of these guys is that we've almost found all of them. We're above 90% completion in finding all one kilometer near-Earth asteroids. So this is actually good. And these are becoming harder and harder to find, though it was in the news today, I believe, or possibly yesterday, that we just found two very, very large ones. Not just one kilometer, we found some that were tens of kilometers in the last week. They were on very bizarre orbits, they got very, very far away from the Earth, but they still had escaped detection for 20 years of our dedicated surveys. So even though we've been looking hard for a long time, they're still out there and we still have trouble finding them sometimes. Just because of the orbits, they're not always in a good part of the sky and it can take a long time. So these are the really big ones. These are the ones that do Chicxulub and the really big impact structures. But what about a little bit smaller? What about the Tunguskas and the Chiliablins? Well, for something the size of Tunguska, maybe 100 meters across, it's predicted there's somewhere around 13,000 of those in near-Earth space. And we're somewhere around 7 or 8,000 that we've discovered. And that line is ticking up. We're doing a better job every year but there's a lot still out there. Now, I want to show this plot for Chelyabinsk, something that's only 20 meters across, but as I described before, we really don't have a handle on how big that population is. So I just guessed, but I'm probably off by a factor of two or three or even five. So we could be way up in the hundreds of thousands. We just don't really know yet. And Chelyabinsk is actually helping us figure that out, but we have a lot of work to do to understand how far off we are. So here's what we're doing today going forward. There's a mission called NEOWISE, run out of JPL here in Los Angeles. Uh, it used to be the WISE mission, which was a survey in the infrared wavelengths of the entire sky going around, orbiting the sun for about three years. But it was so valuable for finding asteroids because in the infrared wavelengths, the asteroids are a little bit brighter than the background stars that we're seeing. The asteroids pop out a little bit and we can find smaller asteroids a little bit easier. So NEOWISE has been turned back on, and it's going to do another three-year survey. Now, we have the OSIRIS-REx mission. This is not out to discover our small asteroids, but it's out there to help us understand their physical properties better. This is the, uh, the mission I mentioned at the beginning. We're going to an asteroid, a near-Earth asteroid, picking up a sample and returning it to Earth. This is a really important mission. We're going to learn a lot about the surfaces of these asteroids and what they're made of and where they come from. And then finally, this is something that's been in the news a lot recently. 
It's been proposed that NASA, going forward, send an astronaut to visit an asteroid. And the problem is, asteroids aren't always very easy to get to. The ones that there's a lot of, those that are tens or 20 meters across, we don't see very well with our telescopes because they're too small. So we don't know where they are. So it's been proposed that we, we get good orbits on very small ones, we go and grab them, bring them back to orbit the Earth and the Moon, and then send an astronaut to visit them. So asteroid retrieval. So something that I was hoping to show that I think we have time for, when we expand our knowledge of the near-Earth asteroid population, one obvious thing to do that we've been doing is we study their orbits in the future to see if any of them are clearly going to impact the Earth. This is definitely something we want to know if we discover a near-Earth asteroid, what the chances are that it's actually going to hit the Earth. And so these studies are really hard to do because there's a lot of perturbations on the orbit of one of these near-Earth asteroids, and their orbits are fundamentally chaotic. So in 2002, we discovered this asteroid, 1950 DA, and it was suggested that it might impact the Earth in 2880, which is very, very, very far away, but it's a test of how well we can make this prediction, a group at JPL did this study. So they took the orbit as best as we knew, and they started adding the different perturbations that we knew were important to affect its long-term evolution. So the center of the galaxy, the tides, pulling and tugging on the asteroid's orbit would change the time in 2880 that the asteroid crossed the Earth by 10 minutes. So over 800 years, we're getting a 10-minute change due to galactic tides. Numerical error based on the size of the numbers that we can represent easily in computers. 12 minutes. Loss of mass from the sun due to the solar wind, 16 minutes the very precise shape of the sun, 49 minutes. They then added in the orbits of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt. So Ceres has half the mass, but Vesta's has 9% of the mass. You go all the way down in the, the 61 largest, and this actually changes the prediction by one day. The uncertainty in how well we actually know the mass of our planets, another day, and then radiation pressure from the sun pushing things around. 9.1. Now, the solar radiation pressure isn't what I described earlier. That was something called the Yarkovsky effect, where we get really fast, dramatic changes in orbit due to this remission of the solar radiation and the uncertainty in the shape and spin properties of the asteroid and the uncertainty in the properties of it absorbing and remitting the solar radiation added up to 57 days in uncertainty and when it would arrive at the Earth in 2880. So not only is it the biggest uncertainty, it's also the biggest lever arm. So if we ever get in a situation where we know that something is a very high probability with the Earth, the best way to change its orbit, the time that it's going to get here, and maybe make it miss, is that Yarkovsky effect, by changing the way it absorbs or reflects solar radiation. And that's why it's been proposed by some groups that one of the best ways to mitigate a hazard caused by an asteroid is to change its reflective properties. And I thought the perfect description of this was this photo. <laughs> we take a dark asteroid, we make it bright, it changes the way it reflects light, and maybe it changes its, order, its orbit enough that we never have to see it. So just a little graffiti and we could solve our problems. So with that, I am out of time. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes where I'm happy to take questions. And then if we have time after that, I have some meteorites uh, that we can look at on our way out. Uh, we can't hold them or play with them, but we can take a glance at some of these meteorites. I'll, maybe I'll get a chance to explain them later. Uh, but that's after questions. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.